All right, please turn your Bibles to an expected verse, uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew 1, 18, and we will be there in, in just a short bit. In 1941, Irvin Berlin was asked to write a Christmas song. And in 1942, the movie Holiday Inn came out featuring the Christmas song, White Christmas. We still sing it to this day. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Some have said that that is the best selling song of all time. I don't know about that. But I reckon we would like to have a white Christmas. Doesn't the thought of of snow-capped roofs and, and just the ground covered in snow on Christmas. It just, just sounds beautiful. I don't believe we're headed there. Last time I looked at the weather, it's going to be in the mid-70s next week. And it kind of gives you that, it just doesn't seem like it should be warm on Christmas. It only seems right if it's cold. And how much more wonderful would it be if it were... A white Christmas. I don't believe we're going to have sleigh bells in the snow, though. Let's go ahead and look at the text tonight. And we're going to look at the first Christmas as we hold that thought about a white Christmas. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together... She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But when he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. There's the first Christmas. All right? And there's no comparison to this Christmas and a, and a white Christmas. A white Christmas sounds good, but it's nothing compared to a right Christmas. There, there's your title for the message tonight. We're going to talk about a right Christmas. And there's some things that you and I need to consider for us to have a right Christmas. A right Christmas includes making room for Jesus. As you know, in Luke chapter 2, when Joseph and Mary were going back to Bethlehem to be enrolled to be taxed, and they arrived, and there was no room for them in the inn. If the, if the time setting of this would have been around the 1930s to maybe the 1980s, there would have been possibly a neon sign flashing saying no vacancy. They, that, that's what they used to do. They had signs, whether it was neon or, or some other sign, it either said vacancy or no vacancy. There's even a few that still do that today. Some have changed it from... It says vacancy, but it doesn't say no vacancy when they're full. It says full house. They say that's more inviting. But anyway, there was no room for them in the end. And you and I, 
We have to be careful in all that we do. There's a lot of fun things that are harmless things that are good that we can gather together. That's good, clean fun that we can do. There's a lot of things that we participate in right now. And it's all okay in in moderation. But we've got to be careful that we don't put things in such a way that there's no room for Jesus. That, that in all that we are doing right now, that, that it's expressing a no vacancy sign to our Lord. So a right Christmas is going to have to do with making room for Jesus. I just kind of made a list of some things that we do this time of year. And, you know, and they're, they're all okay in and of themselves just as long as they don't crowd out Jesus. Because we shop for gifts, we wrap gifts, we fight the traffic, we get concerned about the finances, we stress maybe over the finances and all this that we do, we decorate the tree, we hang Christmas lights, we check these bulbs and we fix the Christmas lights, we hide presents in the closet, we stop and think of what we bought that has said some assembly required, we're thinking when we're in the store about what says batteries not included, and we're thinking how many batteries do we need to buy, if we are married, we, we think what day are we going to go to your families and what day are we going to go to our families. And look, there is so much that we do that comes to our mind and can consume us in such a way that there's a blinking sign before Jesus that says no vacancy. So we have got to be careful. We want to have a right Christmas. And a right Christmas involves making room for Jesus. Celebrating the one true reason for Christmas. And that was a babe coming into this world to save us from our sins. That's what it's about. But also a right Christmas will include worshiping the Lord. In Matthew chapter 2... It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have not seen his, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The wise men came to worship Jesus. Also in Luke chapter 2, we find a man named Simeon. And Simeon was told that before he died, that he was going to see the Savior. And he was waiting to see the Savior. It was, it was what his major focus was, that he believed that promise that was made to him and that he would see the Savior before he died. And he saw him... And the Bible says he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. That's worship. He worshiped the Lord. He was ready to die in peace, giving this reason, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. We can look, as it were, through the spiritual eyes of faith to see our salvation And it's what makes for a right Christmas that that would be our number one focus. Also in Luke chapter 2, there's a woman named Anna. And Anna was a widow. And Anna was older. And she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And in an instant, she gave thanks to the Lord. She worshipped the Lord. She was very old. Her husband had had passed away. But she was very much alive in a life of worship to the Lord. No situation or adversity should take away from our worship of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it, it will do the opposite of the direction we go in during a time of adversity. I mean, sometimes we just kind of feel like it's 
we're not there and we're not feeling it and and we don't worship the Lord. That that's a time that we should just worship him that much more sincerely. And there's no situation that should hinder our worship of the Lord. There's nothing in the Bible that would that would excuse us from doing so. And why would we want it to? In Job's situation, which everyone's familiar with what Job went through, and the Lord said in the middle of his situation, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. In other words, worship me. Worship me through all that you've gone through. Israel had the Egyptians coming up behind them, and it wasn't to catch up to them to have a Christmas party. And before them was the Red Sea. And in that very situation, they were told, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show unto you today. A right Christmas includes worshiping the Lord. The the best place to be gathered in at Christmas for celebration is God's sanctuary. That's the best thing for you and I to be doing, to worship the Lord. That, that's a right Christmas. A right Christmas is going to be worship. A right Christmas is going to be thanking God for His unspeakable gift. A right Christmas is going to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, as it were, and hearing His Word. A right Christmas is going to be meditating on the miracle of God's Son. There's no greater gift than you and I can have on our heart but this. A right Christmas is going to be worshiping the Lord. A right Christmas includes telling others about Jesus. That's a right Christmas. Anna not only fasted and Anna not only prayed and gave thanks, but it says also of Anna in Luke chapter 2 that she spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. The shepherds, it says, made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. The woman at the well, the woman of Samaria, left her water pot and went and said, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? How easy is it to talk to somebody about Jesus right now? Because what is, what's the question everyone asks? I just asked someone that walking around the sanctuary before I got started. Are you ready for Christmas? I think that's a silly question to ask a Christian, but I just did it. And you and I are going to get that question from, from not only acquaintances, but, but strangers. I mean, think about how much you hear that if you're in a store or out and about this time of year. Are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas to be over? What a great opportunity which lies right before you and I. That they bring up the birth of the Son of God, whether they realize it or not. No matter what they think Christmas is, the door is open for a beautiful opportunity to tell of Jesus. I tell you what, that's a joyful Christmas. A joyful Christmas is to tell others about Him, to talk about our Lord. A right Christmas is going to include telling others about the Lord. A right Christmas includes giving. In Matthew 2, in verse 11, it says, When they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened up their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How, how about that? How about Jesus getting something for, for the day that we celebrate his birth? We know that he, that he wasn't born in a few days, but it's the day that we celebrate his birth. And a lot of times it seems like 
people out receive Jesus and he doesn't receive anything himself. Look, may, and, and may we give to others with a ponder in our heart of he who gave his life for us and he gave himself for us. He gave himself to us. That's a good way to express him in giving. That should be on the Christian's heart when we give. May we give to others, but may we give ourselves to him. You might think there's nothing we can give Jesus. The little, the, I, I love the song, The Little Drummer Boy. What, I, I have no gifts to bread. I have nothing I can do for him. But you know what? I'll play my drum for him. I'll play my best for him. We can give our best to him. We can give him our surrender. We can give him our sacrifice. He invites our supplication. We should give that to him. We can bring these things to him. We should bring our minds and our hearts to him. We should give him our obedience. He's worthy of it. And, and we ought to give Jesus something. It makes for a right Christmas when we do. You know, if we were to have a white Christmas, I guess all y'all be excited. Remember what Brother Kenneth said, if the weather changes and it snows next week. But as beautiful as that would be, if we had a white Christmas, you know, the idea of a white Christmas, it, it's all over on December 26. You know, Christmas for many people, it, it's done with, it's over, people are a little down, people are a little depressed on December 26. But actually, for the Christian, Christmas never ends. What a life that we have, that Christmas never ends. I'll never forget giving a, a man a ride one day, uh, I think I had jury duty, and I gave him a ride, and we're going down the road, and the station, my radio's on. When I turn the truck on, there's a Christian choir singing. And I don't remember exactly what time of year it was. I know it wasn't Christmas. And he said, that sounds like Christmas music. And I stopped for a second. I said, well, you know what? It is. <laughs> it is. And, it, and we can listen to it all the time. Christmas is all the time for the child of God. What a, what a life we have. What a, not just a right Christmas, but a right life that we have as children of God. There are going to be people here this Sunday, and maybe we haven't seen them since last Christmas. There's a saying out there. Some people say, I'm a CEO Christian. Christmas and Easter only. The first time... Someone told Scott Hinton that. He said, you better freeze that and get rid of it. Amen. But, but there's some people we, we won't see again that, that we haven't seen since last Christmas. And may, we may see them in service. There's people maybe we've never seen before that we will see this Sunday. Maybe there's people who have never been to church before that will be here this Sunday. Praise God if they are. And, and we hope for the best. But you know what? I mean, the following Sunday, we're going to be here worshiping the Lord. For the, for the Sunday after that, the first Sunday of the year, we're going to be here. By the way, next Wednesday is Christmas, and, and we're going to, for those who can make it, we're going to be here Christmas night. It's a continuous thing for the children of God, this life that we have to celebrate Christ. It's all the time. And it's not just His birth. It's, the, it's back to the prophecy of His birth, something we just shared through an eight-week study. And not, so the prophecy of His birth, His birth, we celebrate His life, His death, His burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his intercession for us right now, his second coming when King Jesus rules and reigns in the millennium. And then, and then that city that comes down out of heaven, that city where the roses never fade, the song says, that we're going to be with him in forever. Christmas is unending for the child of God. What a life. What a life that we have. What a right life we have in Christ. 
May it be a right Christmas. Making room for Jesus. Worshiping the Lord. Witnessing for the Lord. And giving. Giving and thinking and meditating on the one who gave heaven's best for you and I. Our eternal gift. And I'm going to close on those thoughts tonight. And I thought about tonight, I thought about this service and before our Christmas service. And and in just a second, I'm going to ask Brother John Weisenbaker if he'll close us in a word of prayer. And that we might that we might pray for those who will be here Sunday. Maybe those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they have an opportunity to have the first right Christmas in their life. If they would know the greatest gift one could ever have in the forgiveness of sins by knowing Jesus. As Brother John goes in a word of prayer, then the teenagers and Shelly and I are going to dismiss from the room. Go ahead. Father, as we celebrate this time of the year in the birth of Christ, help us to always be focused on that it is the gift of Christ that we have life and life eternal. Mm-hmm. And Father, I just pray that this Sunday that that those that are here to, uh, that gather here this Sunday, Father, that are lost, I just pray, dear God, please, that they would come to the knowledge of Christ and what the gift he is for them. Mm-hmm. And they would be saved, Father. And we thank you for the wonderful and abundant blessings that we have in Christ every day, all year long, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.